Hello and welcome to another edition of Thick Slices and Deep Cuts. Uh, today I'll be ranking the uh, studio albums of one of the greatest bands, uh, in my opinion, of all time, and that is uh, Dream Theater. Uh, they're pretty much the soundtrack to my life, at least since I was probably 17, maybe 16, but definitely by 17. Uh, I've been listening to these guys nonstop. They've had such an impact and been such an influence and an inspiration on me musically. Uh, it, you know, words cannot describe. Um, I won't waste too much more time, but they uh, they have 14 studio albums, uh, and you know, uh, again, much like uh, you know when I ranked the uh, the Rush discography, just because something's coming in at 14 or 13 or 12 does not mean it's a bad album. Um, and this was another tough list to, to put together. I pretty I knew my top four, and I pretty much was confident with my top seven, and I pretty much knew which one I wanted to, to pick last. But um, there were about five albums in there, five or six in the middle that I mean you could just switch them any way you want, depending on what you know, you know what the day is in the week. So, uh, but we'll get right into it. Again, fourteen albums, all excellent albums. Uh, but I'm going to start with um, their first album from 1989, uh, When Dream and Day Unite. Um, I think this is a very cool album. This is the only one uh, that doesn't have James Labrie on vocals. So this has uh, Charlie Dominici on vocals. Um, you know, and he's fine on this. He j you could just tell by the next album and the next album after that that clearly they, they upgraded well when they... Uh, you know, sacked him and moved on. Uh, but again, this is a cool album from 1989. The legendary producer Terry Date was on this. You know, you've got a Fortune and Lies, you've got Eat Say Jam. Uh, I always like The Killing Hand, uh, The Ones Who Helped to Set the Sun, Afterlife, Light Fuse and Get Away. I think this is full of cool songs. So it's only coming in at number 14 just because it doesn't, you know, it's doesn't have James Labrie on vocals, and it's from technically from the 80s, and you know it's a lower budget production. Although it's a pretty good, you know, it's a decent uh, production. But um, you know, I dig this album. I really dig when the band in Labrie perform these songs live with you know with the newer lineup. I think that's great. Much like when Opeth performs songs from their first two albums with the with the newer lineup. So cool album. It's coming in at 14, but it's still a cool album, and I can see why they got a major. A, Big time uh, record deal after this one. So 14, their debut from 89 when Dream and Day Unite. Okay, number 13, you know, it's their latest one from 2019, Distance Over Time. It's cool. I mean, it's so well produced. Everything's just perfect and they've dialed their sound. And my, my uh, you know, I, I saw them on this tour and they played uh, scenes, from a uh, scenes From a Memory in its entirety, but uh, and um, they did play Paralyzed. That's my favorite song probably on here. Barstool Warriors, okay. Room 137's kind of cool. I think the, the, the big, long... Some of these songs are short. This is a shorter album for them. A lot of four-minute type songs. And then the couple of the epics, At Wit's End and Pale Blue Dot. I don't know. I think my problem with this album is... They're not doing anything here we haven't heard them do somewhere before. You know, this is, they're not breaking any new ground on this album, and, you know, some of the songs are shorter, and that's probably a response to the the previous album, which was the longest, so. But, you know, Untethered Angel, I don't care for that chorus that much. You know, S2N, I don't know. I find by the, towards the end of this album, I'm just kind of tuning out the last song, Viper King. I don't know, I just, it doesn't hold my attention. The songs aren't super memorable, but it's not bad. It's okay. I think their problem is they set their own bar so high that then they put out an album like this that doesn't break any new ground, and you're like, eh. But again, if this was if this quality was coming from any other band, you'd be like praising it. So uh, at number thirteen, I've got the most recent one, Distance Over Time. Uh, at number yeah, at number twelve. I've got from 2009, I've got Black Clouds and Silver Linings. Uh, this was the last one with uh, Mike Portnoy on drums. It's uh, it's cool. I mean, A Nightmare to Remember is pretty cool. It opens it up. That's the big track. Uh, a Rite of Passage was the one they had a video for, so that's pretty straightforward and good. It's definitely progressive. You know, Wither, The Best of Times, which, you know, I understand that was Mike Portnoy giving a tribute to his late father. 
those songs don't do too much for me. The Shattered Fortress is kind of cool, although it sounds like they just patched a bunch of riffs together. It doesn't really sound like a real smooth song. The Count of Tuscany is pretty cool. I, I do dig that. It's got good stuff on it. It's just when I'm ranking these, I'm just looking at stuff I like, and I like a lot of stuff better than this album. Um, I do dig the uh, the bonus disc. It's got covers. Uh, they do uh, Rainbow. They do this cool one of Queen from um, the Sheer Heart Attack album. Um, they do one from Zebra, I think, is cool. They do King Crimson. They do uh, To Tame a Land from Iron Maiden. So I actually like the bonus disc of cover songs almost more than the main disc. But it's a cool album, cool cover. Uh, last one with Mike Portnoy. So it's coming in at number 12, but it's a good album. And this is that era of the CDs where I, these could just change all the time. But I've got it at number 12, Black Clouds and Silver Linings. Uh, at number 11, uh, 2005's Octavarium. Um, I want to like this more than I do. I think a lot of people consider this a very big achievement for them, and it's a cool cover. But, you know, I like these walls. I like Panic Attack, and I like the title track, which is 24 plus minutes. Those are all excellent songs. The title track is great. But I find that songs like The Answer Lies Within and I Walk Beside You, The Answer Lies Within is like a little kid's song. I don't even know why it's put on as the number two track. And I Walk Beside You sounds like U2 or something, and Never Enough sounds like the band Muse. And Sacrifice Sun sounds like a weaker version of something we've already heard before. And The Root of All Evil sounds like mediocre Metallica. So there's just a, there are a lot of stylistic things they do on here, which I'm not a big fan of. I think they do everything on here well. They're just not, this is not in my wheelhouse of things I want to hear from them. But it still has good stuff on it. And it's still well done. So it's coming in at uh, number 11, 2005's Octavaria. Okay, coming in at number 10, the, uh, the self-titled album from 2013. Um, you know, I rank Distance Over Time uh, second to last because I think it just sounds kind of like another version of this album. It's just, they're, they're not breaking a whole lot of new ground with this. Um, it sounds cool, though. You know, The Enemy Inside is catchy. The Looking Glass is really melodic. Uh, Enigma Machine is one of my favorite instrumentals they've ever done. That's why this one is ranked higher than Distance Over Time. You know, and you do have a big song at the end, nearly 20 minutes, called um, Illumination Theory. So, you know, my favorite tracks on here, you know, probably Enigma Machine, the instrumental, uh, The Looking Glass is melodic, Enemy Inside's all right, and then the big, you know, epic song at the end. So, this album's all right. It's cool. Self-titled from 2013, Dream Theater coming in at number 10. Okay, at number 9, um... Systematic Chaos from 2007. There's the cover. It looks like that shirt because I saw them on that tour. Um, this one's pretty good. This is their first one with Roadrunner Records. Uh, they have In the Presence of Enemies. Uh, I'm kind of bummed that they broke it into two parts. It was originally a 26-minute song, and then they broke it into part one is the first track, and part two is the last track. And in between, you've got you know some okay songs. Um, the Dark Eternal Night, to me, is a awesome seven string guitar heavy heavy song the ministry of lost souls is also pretty good constant motions okay um you know i think it's a pretty solid album actually i wish they made the the big song one big piece but uh yeah i i don't have too much to say bad about this there might be two or three tracks i kind of skip over usually but they're the shorter ones and, and the good tracks are all the longer ones so yeah, I dig it. 2007 Systematic Chaos coming in at number 9. Uh, coming in at number 8 uh, from 1997, uh, Falling Into Infinity. Um, I must admit I was very disappointed when this came out back in the day. It doesn't have their classic logo on it. Um, and some of the songs sounded almost like radio friendly. You know, You Not Me and Anna Lee, uh, Take Away My Pain, Hollow Years, I don't know. A lot of these songs, I did, I just did not like the direction. But I do like the, you know, New Millennium's cool. Peruvian Skies is pretty good. Burning My Soul is all right. Uh, Hell's Kitchen into Lines in the Sand, they kind of connect. To me, that's the best part of the album. Just Let Me Breathe is pretty catchy. And the big uh, finale, Trial of Tears, the 13-minute closer, is also excellent. So I've grown to like this album a lot more than I did when it first came out. 
And uh, so it's at number eight. It's a pretty good album. Um, okay, at number seven, the first one with Mike Mangini from 2011. This is a dramatic turn of events. This is after Portnoy left the band. Um, and I was kind of, I was, uh, you know, I don't know whose side I was. I wasn't really on anyone's side. I just, it was a bummer that Portnoy left. And I was like, what are they going to do? Well, they did this. And this is coming in at number seven. On the Backs of Angels is excellent. Uh, Lost Not Forgotten is cool. Uh, this is the Life is Pretty Good. Bridges in the Skies Great Outcry is awesome. Uh, Breaking All Illusions might be the best thing on here. So it's just got a lot of big, awesome, progressive tracks. Uh, my one complaint is I don't know why Mike Mangini's drum kit sounds so bad. It sounds terrible, but since he's such an insanely awesome drummer, it's still you can still get into the album. But I mean, thank God Mangini has the skill level he does because the drum sound on here is pretty rough. But um, you cannot deny that it's got. One, two, three, four, five, like six of the nine songs are awesome and long songs too. So you're getting, you know, the only songs I skip are usually the shorter ones too. So this is just chock full of good. If you like progressive metal that's adventurous, good album. And I was surprised. I was thinking it was going to be a great a step down because Portnoy left and I, it was better than their last few, yeah, better than their last few efforts. But coming in at number seven, a dramatic turn of events. Okay, coming in at number six, 2003's Train of Thought. Sure, I saw him on this tour as well. I think I've seen him six times. Um, this was considered their short, concise album at like 67 minutes. Um, but it's just straight ahead. This is their metal album. It's very metal, you know. As I Am is kind of a Metallica type song, but then This Dying Soul, Endless Sacrifice, Honor Thy Father, you get three in a row that are just almost thrashy. Um, Stream of Consciousness is a big, cool, long instrumental, and then you finish it off with uh, In the Name of God, which is, I think, the longest song on the album. So this one's cool. If you like it more, Dream Theater, a little bit more straight ahead with just... The prog on here is more in the crazy soloing back and forth between Petrucci and Rudis. They're going nuts on this, but I love this album for what it is. For what this is, I love it. It's coming in at number six. Okay, coming in at number five is the much maligned 2016's The Astonishing. It's a double album story uh, that the fan base basically did not like. People just hated on this album. I saw them on tour with my buddy Eric. We loved it. They played the entire story, the entire album, the entire concept from start to finish. And I was just, it's different from their other albums. I mean, it's, you know, it's, you know, two hours and 15 minutes long. I mean, it's a long, long CD, but it's cool. I, I just, I was fascinated by the storyline. And when we went to the show, they gave us this program with all the characters. So James Labrie is doing different voices depending on the character. Some of them are kids, some of them are evil kings, some of them are females. So I just was fascinated by how uh, their singer just kept doing different voices for different people and then certain characters had their themes that would recur too. I just thought the whole thing was awesome. And it's progressive metal. They've got dystopian overture instrumental, 2285 and tract, however you pronounce that. you just got these cool instrumentals and you've got Lord Nefarious and a Savior in the Square and Three Days and, you know, Raven's Kill and, you know, it finishes with a really positive one, Our New World, which I think is awesome. It's got these little uh, robotic interludes here and there of these things called Nomax. Uh, but I just was, I was fascinated by how creative and unique and original the whole idea of the album was. And, you know, people that complain about it, I just... I have a CD somewhere that I burned for myself, you know, four years ago, where I basically took, like, if there was anything that I thought was maybe a little too, like, the love theme stuff that comes in and out of this, or something that was maybe, like, so positive, it was kind of silly. If you take that out and boil this down to 80 minutes, you know, fitting the best of this on one 80-minute CD, man, it just flows great. I dig it. I dug the concert, and uh, I guess I'm contrary... I'm, the contrarian on this. Most people would say this is their worst album, and I 
Couldn't disagree more. I think it's highly creative, uh, and I, I'm absolutely fascinated by, by this. So that's number five, The Astonishing. Um, okay, the top four are just all number ones. These are just the classics, in my opinion. And this is probably most people's number one. It's not my number four today. It's from 1999, Metropolis Part Two, Scenes from a Memory. It's another concept album. It's great, uh, what can I say, Overture 1928 and A Strange Deja Vu, uh, Through My Words and uh, Fatal Tragedy are awesome, Beyond This Life is awesome. Home might be my favorite track on here, but the, the instrumentals, The Dance of Eternity, to go with Overture 1928. The instrumentals on here are incredible. One Last Time is awesome. The Spirit Carries On. I'm usually not a fan of lyrics, but this is a that's a really emotional song that I dig. And finally, Free is a great way to end it. This is a great album. This is the first with Jordan Rudis. And man, they really stepped it up on this. Blew me away when it came out. Uh, my number three, it's their second album uh, from 1992. Their first with James Labrie on vocals. This is where I found out about the band through MTV. They had a video for a song called Pull Me Under uh, in 92. I think I heard it in 92. But uh, I don't know what else to say about this album. Pull Me Under, Another Day is a good, uh, almost like a ballad song, but really good. you got to remember the time that this came out, early 90s. Uh, Take the Time is an excellent, again, positive song. Surrounded is another kind of mellower one, but... You know, good. Metropolis Part One might be my favorite song they've ever done. Under a Glass Moon might be another favorite song of mine, and John Petrucci's incredible soloing in that. You know, you got the shorter Wait for Sleep that goes into Learning to Live. Learning to Live is an incredible song. So you just got, you know, Pull Me Under Another Day and Take the Time were the three MTV videos. They lead off the album. The Surrounded is another one I think they were probably stylistically they could have pushed for MTV. So that's the first side. The second side is just loaded with the big, awesome, heavy, progressive ones. Metropolis, Under a Glass Moon, and Learning to Live. This album, I was I was already, this was like my favorite band and I had only listened to one album. That's how important this one was. So at number three, Images and Words, awesome. At number two, love this album. Another double studio CD. Six Degrees of Inner Turbulence. Heavy. Heavy. It's tons of seven strings. Second one with Jordan Rudis, the follow-up to Scenes from a Memory. How do you top that concept album? Oh, I don't know, by doing a double studio album. The Glass Prison is one of my favorites of all time. Blind Faith is catchy, Misunderstood. I think they had a they were pushing that as a, that's the catchy one. The Great Debate is awesome and experimental. The Dark uh, Disappear to End It. And then on side two, you get a 42-minute track to Six Degrees of Inner Turbulence with, you know, what is that? Eight parts, an eight-parter. Uh, I mean, just incredible album. Incredible album. So that's my number two from 2002. And my number one, and you might be able to hear it in the background, is 1994's Awake. I was waiting for this to come out because I was already such a huge fan of images and words. This comes out, it's even longer, it's like 76 minutes long, and suddenly I hear this, what I find out to be seven string guitars, and at that time in 94, only Dream Theater and Morbid Angel were using seven strings. If you talk to me back in the mid 90s, all I would tell you is like, I want to play like Morbid Angel meets Dream Theater. Put those two bands in a blender and that's how I want to play. So this has the seven strings. I just thought the songwriting was so cool on this album. This is the last one with Kevin Moore. You know, six o'clock on a Christmas morning. Six o'clock on a Christmas morning. Caught in a web. Erotomania, the instrumental into Voices, is incredible. The Mirror is one of my favorite songs. That goes into Lie. There's a song towards the end called Scarred. I love this album. I mean, this is my number one. I don't know if it's anybody else's number one, but it's my number one. So... Let's go through them one more time. At number 14, we got the debut when Dream and Day Unite. At number 13, you got Distance Over Time. Number 12, you got Black Clouds and Silver Linings. At number 11, you've got Octavarium. At number 10, you've got the self-titled one from 2013, Dream Theater. At number 9, you've got Systematic Chaos. 
At number eight, you've got Falling into Infinity. At number seven, you've got A Dramatic Turn of Events. At number six, you have Train of Thought. At number five, you've got The Astonishing. At number four, you have Metropolis Part Two, Scenes from a Memory. At number three, you have Images and Words. At number two, you have Six Degrees of Inner Turbulence. And at number one, Awake, which we are listening to right now. Uh, and real quick, just to show you a couple other things. Uh, I didn't rank EPs, but A Change of Seasons is my favorite song. It's a 23-minute song. This came out in uh, May of 95. Um, and it's also got awesome covers. It's got a Led Zeppelin medley where they cover the Rover Achilles Last Stand, and the song remains the same. Three awesome songs. They didn't even touch the first four Zeppelin albums and yet made an awesome medley. And then they do the big medley where they cover Pink Floyd, Kansas, Queen, uh, Journey, Dixie Dregs, and Genesis. So I, I I couldn't rank it because it's not a full-length studio album, but this was critical to me. Live at the Marquee was what I bought to tide me over until Awake came out. They cover Metropolis. This is from 93. Cover Metropolis uh, and uh, Surrounded and Pull Me Under. But what I like about it is they cover Fortune and Lies and Another Hand, The Killing Hand. These are two songs from When Dream and Day Unite when they had the different singer. But LaBrie sings them here live. And I love these versions. So this is cool in that regard. Plus they do an instrumental improv called Bombay Vindaloo. So I just thought this was totally valuable to have. So... For me, the, the heart of dream theater that I just cut my teeth on like when I was like 17, 18, 19, 20, I guess, right in that time frame was, was this little era of like images and words from 92, Live at the Marquee from 93, Awake from 94, and A Change of Seasons from 95. No matter what they do, this will always be my favorite era of the band. That said, I mean, I like when they got Rudis in the band after doing two Liquid Tension Experiment albums. That's another story with that, that incredible collaboration. But this will always be my favorite era of the band. But, man, these were two darn good follow-ups. And they always put out high-quality material. So just a huge fan of Dream Theater, the soundtrack to basically my life since, you know, since I was 17. Um, I recommend, if you can pick one video, score is incredible from 2006. Just covers so much they have an orchestra with them. Breaking the Fourth Wall. This is cool with Mangini on drums. You know. Uh, Live in Tokyo from 92. Five Years in a Lifetime is awesome. Um, you know, here's the CD version of that. Five Years in a Lifetime. Oh, Metropolis 2000 is awesome. They play that in its entirety here. Live at Budokan off the Train of Thought album is cool. Uh, Chaos in Motion 2002, 7, 8. It's kind of raw, but they play in the presence of enemies from Systematic Chaos in its entirety, the whole 26-minute thing. Uh, Live at Luna Park off a dramatic turn of events. You know, I've got this Mike Portnoy. I don't even play drums, and I was just fascinated by how he did drumming for all his side projects and Dream Theater stuff up to that point. So this is pretty cool. Um... And here's Score and Budokan. I got this one autographed by Mike Portnoy when I saw him in Chicago in 2007. Why the Budokan, the CD to go with the, uh, the DVD. And then last but not least, I got this Live Scenes from New York. It came out on September 11th, 2001. And since it was in New York, the fire from the Big Apple is covering the Twin Towers, the two towers. And this came out on 9-11. And as terrible as that day was, I went to Streetside Records that afternoon and bought this because I knew it was coming out that day. How terrible am I? But anyway, they pulled this copy. There's a different cop. There's a different cover that they've been reprinting since the initial print. But I got the original one because I was there on on 9/11 to get this. But um, so that I think that's everything, right? I got the poster back there and I got the shirts. Oh yeah, one other thing. These shirts are in tatters because I love them so much, but on the tour I got the Six Degrees of Inner Turbulence. Saw them in Kansas City for that. And I saw them first time in St. Louis. Fate's Warning opened up for them. Uh, Awake. And this t-shirt's torn to shreds too, but that's awesome. So, so there you go. That is ranking uh, Dream Theater. So uh, hopefully you found this one uh, interesting as well. And thank you for, uh, for watching, and uh, I will see you next time. See ya.